Hey, what is greater than God? If you will, okay. What is greater than God? More evil than the devil. The poor have it. The rich don't need it. And if you eat it, you will die. One more time. There's a one word answer to this riddle. What is greater than God? More evil than the devil. The poor have it. The rich don't need it. If you eat it, you will die. And um, I won't hold you in suspense, so I'll just tell you the answer. The word is nothing. Nothing. And of course, you're clued in with the first question, right? What is greater than God? What? Nothing is greater than God. In fact, you can, you can work it through the entire riddle. What is more evil than the devil? Nothing. The poor have it, right? The poor have what? Nothing. The rich don't need nothing. And if you don't eat nothing, what happens to you? You die. And what does that have to do with this sermon? What's the answer? No. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. All right. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Genesis. We have announced that we're going back to our series, Back to Genesis. Back last fall when we returned to the church in the midst of COVID-19, I suggested that uh, maybe the book we ought to focus on is Genesis and how to get a handle on life. Because Genesis is not just about how the world began, Genesis is about how life works. And we learn lessons about life from the life of Genesis. And we have been slowly working our way through this book and now, a few weeks ago, we began the last lap, the life of Joseph. And when we ended two or three weeks ago, Joseph had just been sold to the Midianite, Ishmaelite traders and taken down to Egypt. And what we notice as we look through the life of Joseph is that Joseph... Joseph gets more screen time than anybody else in Genesis. Even Abraham, the father of the faith, doesn't get as much screen time, prime time, like Joseph does. But more importantly, we notice in the book of Genesis, and since we're talking about how to get a handle on life, we notice that Joseph, his story, his life, and all that we have left to take us up to the 50th chapter, the end of Genesis, it all pivots around a dream, around Joseph's dreams. That's rather significant in terms of the role of vision in my life and in your life. And by the way, as we talk about how to get a handle on life, um, one of the things that struck me as I was studying and thinking about this this week is the only way to understand how we get from Genesis 1 verse 1 in the beginning God to the last verse and the last sentence of Genesis chapter 50 which says, you know what it says? In a coffin in Egypt. Joseph was laid up after he was embalmed in a coffin in Egypt. The only way you can understand how you get from in the beginning God to a coffin in Egypt is to understand life and how life works and how life doesn't work as we observe here in this, in this uh, chat, in this book, the first book of the Pentateuch. And so what we're learning today, what we're observing in this quote by Will Mancini is very apropos to what we are studying today. Will Mancini, the founder of Axano Ministries, he says, experiencing vision is a fundamental part of what it means to be human. 
Experiencing vision is a fundamental part of what it means to be human. If you are human, and you all are, I am, and if you don't dream, if you don't think of the future, a vision is a clear mental picture of a preferable future. And if that's not happening for you, you're not being fully human. Something is standing in the way of your true humanity. Vision is a fundamental part of what it means to be human. Why? Because I dream, and you dream, and we all dream, and the reason we all dream is why? Because God dreams. Because God is the original dreamer. On a balcony of space stood a pure and holy God. And there in awesome solitude he stood alone. And he saw you and he saw me. He envisioned us before he made us. And here we are. He's the dreamer. And God said in Genesis 2, let us make man how? In our own image. And because we are his image bearers, we are dreamers. We're dreamers. We can't help but dream. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, verse 11, I believe it is, that God has put eternity in our hearts. And we are to be, we are to lead a quality of life that reflects the nature of the God who made us. And so every human invention, every human invention is a manifestation of a dream that was dreamed before that thing was invented. From the airplane to the automobile to the pew on which you sit today to the device that our Zoom friends are watching and our Facebookers are watching on today. It's all because of a dream. Every, every human invention is the result of a dream. To be human is to dream. As a matter of fact, let me just put it out there today and say, nothing happens in life unless we dream. God not only gives us dreams, God fulfills some of our dreams, and even our most shattered dreams are not beyond the reach of God's providence. The fact that you're alive means that there is at least one dream in your heart. And the goal of today's message is to help you nurture that dream. The goal of today's message is to encourage you to live your life for the fulfillment of that dream, no matter how old you are, and no matter what all the tragedies are that have happened in your life. In fact, Will Mancini says... Vision is a human activity wrapped up in the incredible privilege of partnering with a God who dreams. Well, that brings us to Genesis 37. In Genesis 37, Joseph was hated by his brothers. Joseph's dreams angered his brothers. They wanted to murder him. One day when he went out to see about them, they plotted to, mur to kill him. Reuben, the voice of reason, says, don't kill him. Just throw him in the pit. And Reuben wanted to come back and get him later. But then Judah, old Judah, remember Judah. Judah says, why, why leave him in the pit? You know, let's sell him. If we're going to get rid of him, at least let's make some money off of him. And so Judah negotiated and they sold Joseph for silver and Joseph was taken down to Egypt. That where we end, that's where we ended in chapter 37. Skip chapter 38. And now we come to chapter 39. And we find Joseph in Egypt and the dream is tested. And so since we don't have a lot of time and since Brother John was up late early this morning and he's very sleepy. Let me give you four words. Four words to help you work your way quickly through the 23 verses of Genesis 39. The first word is enslavement. Verse 1, Joseph was down in Egypt. He was there. He was the first Hebrew slave. Long before 
Hebrew slavery became official. Joseph, he preceded them. He was the first Hebrew slave. Verses 2 to through verse 6, the, the, the A part of verse 6, advancement. Advancement. The first movement in the passage is enslavement. The second movement is advancement. Everything Joseph set his hand to do, God blessed. And despite the fact that he was down there in prison, God blessed him. The word is advancement. And then we come to the third word, beginning in the B part of verse 6, all the way down to verse 19. This is the middle section, the longest part, section of this chapter. The word is harassment or harassment, whatever way you pronounce that. Mrs. Potiphar laid her eyes on Joseph. And she sought to seduce him. It says in verse 7, And it came to pass after these things, that the master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said to him, Lie with me, lie with me. And she didn't just say it once, she said it day after day after day after day. And so the third word, beginning verse 20 through verse 23, or I'm sorry, the fourth word is the word imprisonment. Imprisonment. Joseph is in prison. He was a slave, but things were working good for him until Mrs. Potiphar wanted to go to bed with him. And when he said no, one day she grabbed a hold of him and he ran and left his coat in her hands. And when hubby came home, she said, see, this Egyptian, this Hebrew you brought down here, he tried to rape me. And see, I have evidence. And they threw, uh, Potiphar threw Joseph in prison. That famous quote that says, heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. Mrs. Potiphar, it was not enough that she tried to seduce Joseph. Now that it didn't work out, she was determined to do him harm. And so Joseph ends up in prison behind bars for a sin that he did not commit. And Joseph did not just end up in prison, in just not, not any prison. Joseph ended up, the Bible says, in a special prison where, where Pharaoh's prisoners were held. These are the espionage people. This is, this is the Guantanamo of Egypt, all right? As a matter of fact, I notice, I note, that imprisonment seems to be the lot of most, of most transformational leaders in the world. Those men, those women who have been most successful in making long-term transformational change in the human family are people who have ended up in prison. I wrote, I wrote down Alexander Solzhenitsyn from the Russian Gulag, and you've read about that. And, and Mahatma Gandhi, as he struggled with the British Mother England to let the people of India go, and Dr. Martin Luther King in the Civil Rights Movement, and Nelson Mandela in South Africa and apartheid, and all these men ended up behind bars in prison like Joseph. Why? Because the dream has to be tested. And how do we pass the dream test? Well, we're going to observe the life of Joseph today. Because Joseph is put in prison and pretty soon Joseph is in charge of the prison. How do you pass the dream test? Well, the typical way that we see this is that we focus on Joseph's character, his integrity. We see no bitterness. Joseph is just focused on God. In fact, we have noted, I have noted over the years in my preaching, 
that Joseph is one of two people in the Bible of whom not one negative word is ever spoken. They're both in the Old Testament. One is Joseph, the other is Daniel. You can't say that for David. You can't say that for Solomon. You can't say that for the other guys. But for Joseph, there's not one negative word spoken. And we tend to think that that's his key to passing the dream test. That that's the key to his success. And by the way, um, I should stick a pin here and say that Joseph's character, Joseph's integrity, is very, very important. Character counts. As Andy Stanley reminds us, everybody has character. It's just a matter of whether or not it's good character or bad character, but we all have character. Character is what you are deep down on the inside. So when I'm jostled, when I'm upset, when I'm hurt, what comes up is my character, my deep inner core person who I am. So basically, let's not, let's not downplay the fact that Joseph was a man of character, good character and great integrity. In fact, Joseph's survival of the prison and his success is related to the fact, as Andy Stanley says, that character is the internal script that determines how I respond to failure, to success, to mistreatment, and whatever else happens to me. And character counts. Can we all say that? Character counts. We're, we, character counts. We're not, we're not downplaying that. We're not downplaying the fact that to do my best work, I need to be my best self. We're not, we're not, we're not setting that aside. But here's what we want to notice in the passage today. And, and, and by the way, before I even get to that, let me, let me say very quickly... The author of Genesis, who is Moses, uh, widely believed to be Moses, um, he opens up the life of Joseph in chapter 37. Now here we are in the second message in chapter 39. What's, what's happening in 38? Anybody know? In, in 38, we have the story of Judah. You have to wonder, why did Moses zoom the camera, narrow the lens, and just kind of zero in on Judah for a, a chapter, and then come back? What is it that he wants us to notice about Judah in relationship to the story? That's what a careful observer of scripture needs to ask. And I had to wrestle with that question as I worked on this message. And here's what I want to say. God causes his grace to abound even to the worst of sinners. And Judah, who is going to become the father of the Jewish people, Judah, the word Jew comes from Judah. Judah will become the father of Israel eventually through this line, through Jacob. Judah, his life, as we read it in Genesis 38, says that God will fulfill his purposes even through broken people. As we see Judah and his breaking his promise to his daughter-in-law and then sleeping with her thinking she was a prostitute and, and all of that ugly stuff in chapter 38, we are reminded, we're reminded, this is very important here in context, that, that, that Joseph is down in Egypt getting what he doesn't deserve while Judah is over in chapter 38 getting what he does deserve as he's rebuked by God for his... It's just fascinating to me how the scriptures come together. In fact, I came across a quote, and I want to share this with you. It's by, it's by John Vonter, John Vonter, in his work entitled Becoming Human, Becoming Human. And he says, becoming human, it's not, it not only means that we have to lose some of our power and our privilege and our self-image. 
And today in the midst of our social dilemma and our social tensions in our country, the word privilege is hot on the radar screen. Bunter says, it's not that we have to lose some of our power and privilege and self-image, but also that we have to look at the shadow side in ourselves, the brokenness and even the evil in our own hearts and in our culture. And that requires moving into a certain insecurity. In other words, Part of the reason for the tension that we're facing, even in our culture, this social tension that the word racism and the history of this country and white privilege and these words that are being thrown around, the issue here is that when we begin to deal with these things, it moves us into a place of insecurity and vulnerability because it makes us, it, it forces us to know, to ask the question, what am I going to do with my own guilt and my own complicity and, and all the arguments that people make today, and I don't want to go off on that trail, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. Back earlier in Genesis, as Judah comes up with the idea to sell Joseph, and after they sold him, Judah sat, they said they sat down and just had a meal. As if it didn't even matter. Because Judah did not understand his, whole, his own humanity in relationship to Joseph's humanity. That we're all part of a tangled web of humanity. And that injustice in my heart, injustice anywhere, is injustice everywhere. And we can't turn from it and say, I didn't do it, and I'm not involved, and it doesn't that have nothing to do with me. That's not how life works. And sorry for all of that, but all of that comes up there as we think of why chapter 38 is where it is. What I'm trying to say is that even though Joseph was a man of tremendous integrity and character, the issue is that Joseph was human. The issue is that Joseph didn't know how the story was going to end. We know how the story ends, but at this point, Joseph has no idea how the story ends. He doesn't know he's going to become the prime minister of Egypt. He doesn't know that he's going to end up saving his family. He's dreamt this dream that he has in his heart. But he doesn't know that his brothers are going to come down two years later down to Egypt and bow to him. He doesn't know that. And so when you don't know the details, when you don't have the fine print, what do you do? And I want to suggest to you today that Joseph dealt with the same pain that you and I dealt with, that you and I deal with. When Joseph talks to the butler, and he tells the butler, when you get out of here, please speak up for me. Why? Because he says, I don't deserve what is being done to me. Do you hear Joseph's pain? And when Joseph's brothers finally come down to Egypt and they bow to him, and when he hears them speaking and they're talking about this brother that they thought they killed, and he's standing there, and they don't know that he can hear, they he understands their language, and he says that Joseph ran away into the other room and wept. What, what you're hearing there is the collective pain and the grief of the, the suffering of what he went through at the hands of his brothers. So the question is, what is it that fueled Joseph's consistency the consistency of his walk. Obviously, he was a man of character and integrity, but it's not like that's the end of it all. There's something else. Here it is. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, Genesis 39. 
The Lord was with Joseph. Let's say that together. The Lord was with Joseph. Drop your eyes down to verse 21. This is, he's now in prison. Verse 3, he's in Potiphar's house, and the Lord was with Joseph and made him successful. And Potiphar finally realized that his own success is because Joseph was working for him. And so he gave everything over to Joseph. Now in, chapter, in verse 21, he's in prison. And it says, but the Lord was with Joseph. Let's say that together again. But the Lord was with Joseph. God made Joseph successful in everything that he did, which endeared him to everybody who was over him. Even in prison, it says that the prison guard didn't have any clue what was going on in the prison because he, he turned the prisoners over to Joseph. That's how impressive Joseph's life was. But what we're saying today, impressive as it was, bottom line, where the rubber meets the road, the real issue is that God was with Joseph. Even our capacity to say no to temptation is a gift of God's grace. That classic old hymn by Augustus Toplady, Rock of Ages, Cled for Me, Let Me Hide Myself in Thee, Listen to the last verse, not the labor of my... Well, this is the third verse. In our book, we omit the fourth verse because it doesn't match our theology. But the third verse says, Not the labor of my hands can fulfill the, thy lost demands. Could my zeal no respite know, nor my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone, thou must save and Thou alone, only Jesus, only Jesus. L let, me, let me just emphasize here the point. The point is the glory in all of this is that God chooses to use us even though God doesn't need us. that the best of us are men at best, and that even those of us who are character-driven and obedience-driven and purpose-driven, at the end of the day, we all need the grace of God in Jesus. And so when the dream is tested, there are four things that we need to know. When the dream is tested, when the dream that you have in your heart, when the dream that you dream, as you dream, I'm thinking of my wife's father, whom all of you knew, Calvin Himes. He was a man of poetry, and there were poems that marked his life. And if you've heard him say a poem once, you've heard him say it a thousand times. One of the poems that he repeated constantly, I've dreamed many dreams that never came true. I've seen them vanish at dawn. But I've seen enough of my friends true blue to make me want to keep, say it, dreaming on. Just dream on. I don't know if my mother-in-law is online today. But if she is, I hope that this warms her heart. Calvin dreamed, and he dreamed, and he knew what it meant to be bereft of his dreams. And he believed in dreaming. But when we dream, there are some things that we need to remember because our dreams get tested. And when our dreams are tested, number one, we need to remember that God's counsel always stands. God's counsel always stands. Psalm 33, verse 11 says that the counsel of the Lord stands forever, 
and the plans of his heart to all generations. The counsel of God will always stand. Let me anchor this in the, in the passage. When you're reading Genesis 39, you have to think back to Genesis 12, after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, Babel, God called Abraham and God said, Abraham, you follow me, a pagan man from Ur the Chaldees. And God said, if you follow me, I will make of you a what? A great nation. And God repeated and repeated and repeated the promise. It is his counsel, it is his will, it is his plan to raise up a nation and now God is about to fulfill that promise through Joseph. And prison will not stop it. Because the counsel of God will stand. Can, people, can you say amen to that? Amen. Harassment can't stop it. Enslavement can't stop it. Mistreatment can't. The counsel of God stands. Proverbs 19, 21 says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Proverbs 19, 21. Write it down. There are many plans in a, law, in, in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. God promised it to Abraham. God promised it to Isaac. God promised it to Jacob. God promised it, it is God's counsel and nothing will thwart God's will. Not even imprisonment. And the dream in Jacob's heart, it is around that dream that God weaves the final and ultimate fulfillment of the promise he made to Abraham and God's counsel will stand. Number two, when the dream is tested, remember the testing is the means by which God perfects his purposes in our lives. God needs to perfect his purpose. James says in the book of James, James chapter 1 verse 3, Knowing this, that it is the testing of your faith that produces patience. God has something in Joseph that is so beautiful that he's weaving. And the only way to weave it, the only way to fulfill that, the only way to bring that to pass is to test him. To test him. In fact, God needs to shape the vessel in which the dream is contained. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says in verse 7, For we have this treasure... This dream, this promise, this hope, we have this treasure in what? In earthen jars of clay. And the reason the jar is of clay and not iron or brass, it's of clay because God has to mold it and shape it and bend it and make it. And he has to shape me. And I have to come to terms with the contradictions of my own life and my own heart. It is through testing that God perfects his dream in our lives. In fact, we, if we are dreamers at heart, we really should every once in a while put our dream to the test. Even when we're not being tested, we ourselves should put our dreams to the test. And did you know Dr. John Maxwell? John Maxwell came up with, he wrote a book, a fairly large-sized book called Put Your Dream to the Test. And the book is woven around 10 test questions for your dreams. I want to highlight them today, if you don't mind. The first is the ownership question. The ownership question, is my dream really my own dream? You've got to own your dream. Do you dream? What is your dream? Do you own it? 
Number two, the clarity question. Do I clearly see my dream? Number three, the reality question. Am I depending on factors within my control um, to activate my dreams? You know, Joseph had a dream that was bigger than Joseph. Uh, Joseph had a dream that if it, were, if it were to depend just on Joseph, nothing would ever happen. And he didn't just need God. He, need, he needed some people with flesh and bones, you know. They say in the anatomy of a dream, we all need three people in our lives. We need a Potiphar. We need a person who believes in us and is willing to give to us the privilege. And, and secondly, we need a butler, somebody to remember us when push comes to shove. And thirdly, we need a pharaoh. We need a pharaoh who will fund our dreams and give us the position, give us the privilege. And that's later on. But the number, number three, the reality, number four, the passion question. Does my dream compel me to follow it? Number five, the pathway question. Do I have a strategy for achieving my dream? And then the people question. This is the one that I should have waited for to tell you what I just told you. Have I included the people in my life? I can't dream my dreams alone. Success is too significant to go there alone. Got to take somebody with me. Number seven, the cost question. Am I willing to pay the price? Joseph was. The tenacity question. Am I moving closer to my dreams? The fulfillment question. Does working toward my dream bring satisfaction and joy to my life? And finally, the significant question. Does my dream benefit other people? Is my dream all about me and myself and I? Or does my dream benefit others? And Joseph's dreams, by the way, was not about Joseph. It was about saving his family. It was about saving a nation. When you, look about, when you look at one man's legacy through his dream, this is, this is such an awesome story. So number three, thank you very much. Number three, when the dream is tested, remember that God accomplishes his will despite our ignorance of the details and the mistreatment of other people. When your dream is tested, remember that God accomplishes his will despite your ignorance of the details. Joseph didn't know the details of how this was going to play out, but it didn't matter to him. He didn't get bitter. He didn't get sour. He didn't say, well, if this is what God's going to do to me, I'll just sit here and pout till he comes back. No. No, but remember, God will fulfill his purpose in our lives, even when we don't know the details, and even despite the mistreatment and the unfairness of other people. The world is filled, the church is filled with people who wreathe beneath the pain of all the things that others have subjected them to and done to them. Don't know about you, but I've been there. And when the dream is being tested, we remind ourselves that that's not the end of the story. That despite all of that, I can trust God. I can love God and I can love others. And then number four, here is the way we pass the dream test. We pass the dream test by demonstrating that our heart is tethered not to the dream, but to the dream giver. What saved Joseph? What kept Joseph? What blessed Joseph? What made Joseph successful is that when Joseph came to what seemed like the death of the dream, it didn't matter to Joseph because in Joseph's heart, he was tethered, he was tied, he was attached by the hip. Not to the dream, but to the God of his dreams. That deserves a little amen to that. Amen. 
So when Mrs. Potiphar said to Joseph, Joseph, lie with me, Joseph was sold into Egypt. Nobody knew where he was. He knew no one in Egypt. He was alone with Mrs. Potiphar. Had he slept with her, no one would have known, no one would have cared. But in Joseph's heart, deep down in his mind, Joseph thought, God sees, and God knows, and God cares. How can I do this wicked thing and what sin against Mrs. Potiphar? Sin against Potiphar? Sin against God. Sin against God. And today I speak, I preach today, very cognizant of the fact that not all of us are where Joseph was. Not all of us have said no to Mrs. Potiphar. And Mrs. Potiphar shows up today in all kinds of ways. On our telephone, on our TV screens, on, in relationships of all kinds. And, and not all of us have the testimony that Joseph had. Some of us have to confess that we gave in. And there are those of us here today who are having to confess and reflect on the fact that as we have gone through our testing, we haven't been like Joseph. We've, we've become a little bitter. We've become a little complaining. We've become a little focused in here because, because I hurt and because somebody ought to vindicate me. And, and we understand that. That's why today our focus is not so much Joseph, but Joseph's God. Joseph's God. The God who loves, the God who forgives, the God who cares, the God who gives grace. And God's grace is given to us through his son Jesus. He's the ultimate dispenser of the grace of God. And today we are reminded that the word Joseph and the word Jesus are related. The word Joseph and the word Joshua and the word Jesus in the, in the root of the Hebrew are all the same word. That's what causes the confusion in Hebrews 4, where it says that if Joshua had given them rest, and in some translations they say if Jesus had given them rest, speaking of the Israelites, the word Jesus and the word Joseph are really Josef, Jesus, same word. In fact, in fact, Joseph in Genesis is a type of Christ. And we see it when we see his coat of many colors. The, 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 the heavenly robe in which Jesus was robed. And when we see his brothers hating him, we see how Jesus' brothers hated him. And when we see how Jesus was put in the pit, we think of Jesus being put in the grave. And when we see Reuben coming back to find him and he wasn't there, we think of Jesus when they came back to the tomb and he wasn't there. Do you see this? Joseph is a type of Christ. And when we see Joseph in the palace down in Egypt, we think... We think of Jesus. When we, see, when we see Pharaoh take his signet ring off his finger and put it on Joseph's finger and made him, gave him authority in Egypt, only second to the throne, we think of Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father at the place of authority, exalted. Can the church say amen to that? This is beautiful. From pit to pinnacle. 
When you think of the words of Jesus, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke is? It's a neck piece where you, carry, where you lead the cattle. Come take my yoke upon you and learn of me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is easy and light about Jesus' yoke? And by the way, you know what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs? You should bear the yoke in your youth. Bear the yoke in your youth. Joseph is but 30 years old around now. And he's bearing the yoke. And the yoke is easy because when you've got a neck piece that has two parts to it, and when Jesus Christ is in one part, he always carry the heavier part of the yoke. And that makes his yoke easy, and it makes his burden light. We can trust Jesus, even in the midst of our shattered dreams. And so I close today with the words of Ella Wheeler Wilcox. That fine poem, Ella Wheeler Wilcox says, I will not doubt. Though all my ships at sea come drifting home with broken masts and sails, I will believe the hand which never fails from seeming evil worketh good for me. And though I weep because those sails are battered, Still will I cry while my best hopes lie shattered. I trust in thee. I will not doubt, though all those sorrows fall like rain and troubles swarm like bees about a hive. I shall believe the heights for which I strive are only reached by anguish and by pain, and though I groan and tremble beneath my crosses, I yet shall see through my severest losses the greater gain, the greater gain. Don't doubt. Keep the dream alive. Keep the dream alive in your heart. Find a place for your dream to grow. Nurture it and surrender it to Jesus. And as Elizabeth Elliot always says, anything gladly and willingly surrendered to God will always become our gateway to joy. Amen.